have a full house. Woo! Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. We are live streaming this, and we're also recording this. For all of you that are on the live stream, if we have technical difficulties, don't you worry. We are going to send you the recording because we're using Wi-Fi, and we're just hoping everything's going to work. So far, so good. We have lots of people watching online right now. Hi from everybody here to all of you there. There's people from all over the province that have, that have signed in to join us today. So my name is Angela Bischoff. I'm the director of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. We formed, oh. We are the small but mighty group that formed around the coal phase out. We led the campaign to phase out coal in, Ontar in Ontario. And Ontario led the world. We were the first jurisdiction to phase out coal for environmental and health reasons. So Ontario has been a leader on the environmental front. I'd just like to open uh, with a land acknowledgement. I'd like to extend my respect to all Indigenous peoples for their valuable past and present contributions to this land. I acknowledge the waters, air, lands, and resources that continue to create safe space for our gatherings, our workplaces, and homes. And I recognize and respect the importance of Indigenous leadership in protecting and stewarding the land. So I'd like to welcome you all here tonight and uh, on live stream. We, we are all here for one reason, to learn more and discuss what to do to counter Doug Ford's plans to ramp up gas power in this province and in this city. Just south of here, about a kilometer as the crow flies, near our beloved Leslie Street spit, is Toronto's Portland's gas plant. Despite Toronto City Council's explicit opposition, the IEESO, or the Independent Electricity System Operator, just last month announced an expansion of this urban gas plant. The Portland's gas plant is already the largest greenhouse gas emitter in all of the GTA, and it's the largest emitter of nitrogen oxides in Toronto, meaning it's bad for our health and it's bad for the climate. So as summers get hotter and drier thanks to climate change and the world grapples with how to phase out fossil fuels, Ontario is going in the opposite direction, raising emissions from the electricity sector by 700% by 2043. Not just at the Portland's gas plant, but at a dozen sites from Ottawa to Windsor. This, despite the fact that we have much lower cost options to meet all our electricity needs, wind and solar power, including wind in the Great Lakes, conservation, water power, and storage imports from Quebec, we have many lower cost, cleaner options than gas and nuclear, which is what the provincial government is, is opting for. So why are they going for gas and nukes when we have lower cost, cleaner alternatives? I mean, clearly they're representing different interests. They're not in representing you and I, the environment, the taxpayer, the renewables industry. They're, they're representing the large gas and nuclear industries, the status quo. So what can we as citizens do to counter this direction that Doug Ford is taking us in the electricity sector? And, and, how, and what can we do here in Toronto to push back against the Portland's expansion? So today we will hear from three environmental and political leaders how we can together work, work together to stop Ford with these disastrous plans. 
To begin, we'll have Mike Schreiner. He's the MPP for Guelph and the Ontario Green Party leader. Then we'll have Peter Tabbins, MPP for this riding of Toronto Danforth and the NDP critic for energy and climate action. Then Mary Margaret Ma McMahon, MPP Beaches each East York. That's the riding just east of here. She's the liberal critic for the environment and former Toronto City Councillor. I'd like you to know we also invited Councillor Paula Fletcher, Julie DeBrusen, the local MP, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, MP of Beaches East, East York, and Todd Smith, Energy Minister. They all had other commitments, though Todd Smith didn't get back to us. <laughs> Shock! I'm sure, I checked my email. <laughs> so after hearing short presentations from each of these three speakers, we're opening up the floor to the people who are on the live stream, as well as to all of you. And I have a microphone, I'm gonna take it out into the audience, or you can come back here if you wanna be on camera, come up here. And we'll have like a good 45 minutes to converse about what we do, how do we organize around this, uh, this disastrous uh, direction. So if everyone's okay with that, I'll hand the mic over to Mike. Well, thank you. Hi. Well, thank you, Angela. Thank you, Peter, for uh, welcoming us to your writing. And Mary Margaret for uh, welcome to the next door uh, neighbor writing. Uh, it's a real honor to be here with you and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Angela, for the fantastic introduction and the uh, land acknowledgement. Man, if there was ever a time we needed indigenous wisdom, it, it's right now. Uh, we, yeah, thank you. Yes, exactly. We have indigenous wisdom right here in the front row, a long time indigenous wisdom. So, um, uh, I want to thank you all. Most of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. And the reason being is what is going to stop the expansion of the Portland's gas plant and the Ford government's ramping up of gas plants across this province is people power. And it's the people power, the people in this room. It's the people who are gonna take those signs that are in the back and put them in their yards. It's the people who are gonna tell their MPPs, the premier, the energy minister, that this is unacceptable. It's the people who are gonna tell the federal government that this province has to meet the clean electricity standard. Uh, it should be before 2035, but at least by 2035, um, if we're gonna have any hope of meeting our climate obligations. And the bottom line is, is the Ford government right now is engaged in a war against people and planet. And I say people because the emissions from this gas plant is not only about climate pollution, it's about nitrogen oxide, it's about VOCs, it's about particulate matter, it's about air pollution that's gonna negatively affect the health of everyone who lives in this riding and who lives across the waterfront. You know, I was just at Ontario Place before I came here, and I feel like Doug Ford's engaged in a war on Ontario's water, or on Toronto's waterfront between the privatization of Ontario Place, the ramping up of the Portland's gas plant, and the ramping up of gas plants across the province, which makes absolutely no sense financially, economically, or environmentally. And, you know, it's no wonder the city council here in Toronto was like, no, we don't want this gas plant to be expanded. And, you know, in the same way the Ford government's broken their promise not to open the Greenbelt for development, they're breaking their promise uh, to listen to so local councils. Like Todd Smith directly said, if local councils don't want to see gas plants, we won't build gas plants. And in this case, expand a gas plant. So, you know, they've broken that promise as well. And all of it, all of it stems from the gross mismanagement of the province's electricity system. You know, when this government first got elected, they canceled 750 renewable energy contracts at a cost of $231 million to all of us, the taxpayers of Ontario. They canceled the energy efficiency and conservation programs that help people save money by saving energy. And little wonder now we're facing an energy crunch. And so instead of choosing the cheapest, cleanest, and fastest to deploy option, which would be reinstating energy efficiency and conservation programs and rolling out renewables, they're choosing 
the most expensive, the dirtiest, and the longest to deploy when it comes to nuclear options to deal with their mismanagement of the electricity system. And we're already paying for it. You're already paying for it here. You know, emissions from the Portland's gas plant, 188,000 tons in 2017, 618,000 tons in 2021. And it's only going to get worse as this government expands production and extends the operating life of the plant as well. All of it. And I know I'm almost, I'm going to finish up shortly, but all of it when we're facing a climate emergency. My gosh, how many of you, like my allergies have been through the roof over the last month because of all the smoke in the air. The state of Vermont is literally underwater right now. Country of Pakistan, like they're still dealing with the floods that destroyed their country last year. We've seen what's happening. Like I was listening to a podcast today, are they gonna rebuild Linton, BC or not? You know, literally vaporize. Um, because of the forest fires and the heat dome. Um, the Southwest United States, literally wondering if they're going to have enough water for their communities. And we talk about food inflation. My gosh, the biggest driver of food inflation is the fact that most of the major growing areas around the world are experiencing significant drought and they can't grow enough food or where we import vegetables from California, the valley's underwater. No wonder our food prices are going up and you know retailers are probably taking advantage of that as well. But we are facing a climate emergency. And the International Energy Association has said, and they're pro-historically fossil fuel, they've said, if we're going to meet our climate obligations, we cannot have any expansion of fossil fuels. And yet this government's ramping up gas plants at a time when the rest of the world is going in the exact opposite direction. $1.1 trillion last year invested in the clean energy transition, $500 billion of that going to wind and solar. Why? Because it's the cheapest source of electricity generation. Even the IEA says solar is now the cheapest source of generation in all of history. So no wonder the EU last year saw a 24% increase in wind and solar, now generating more electricity than gas and coal. No wonder international investors are on track this year alone, including, according to Bloomberg, to invest 1.7 trillion in renewables, far outpacing any investment in the oil and gas sector. So instead of Ontario choosing the cheapest, cleanest, fastest to deploy solutions, energy efficiency and conservation, help people save money by saving energy, low cost renewables, water imports from Quebec, they're choosing the highest cost, dirtiest solution. And what it's going to take to stop it is people power. And that's why I'm so excited to see my good friend Peter Tabbins, my good friend Mary Margaret McMahon here, representing the three opposition parties at Queen's Park. We need to unite. You need to unite. We need to unite people across this province and say no. No to the destruction of our electricity system, our economy, our finances, and our climate. So thank you all for being here tonight. Like Mike, I have to say, it is wonderful to see all of you here this evening. It really, you're a good looking crowd. Uh, you're a big crowd. Those of you who are online, I'm sure you're good looking as well. Uh, it's nice to have you here. And I want to thank the Ontario Clean Air Alliance for pulling this together, and my colleagues, Mike Schreiner and Mary Margaret Mahan, for being willing to speak to Mike, because this is a critical issue. No getting around it. I don't think I'm going to need to do a lot of persuading in this crowd. I, I think you've got most of the argument. Um, I hear you use a bit of that war analogy. Let's face it, be very clear, Doug Ward, Doug Ford, is waging war on the environment. And he wants a biblical future for us, and not the good parts of the Bible, not the really popular turning water into wine or the crowd pleaser walking on water. No, fire and brimstone, <laughs> pestilence and famine. That is his program. That is his program. And believe me, I am not exaggerating. The announcement of the expansion of gas-fired power in Ontario is the central part of what he's doing. And Angela's quite right. This is driven by gas interests, private power interests. There are billions to be made, billions to be made in making this world hotter. No getting around. And this is a government that wants to make that happen. When this plan was proposed, 
in Toronto Danforth in 2006. I opposed that plan. I worked with people in the community oh, to fight against it. Yeah. Our by-election that year against the Liberals was to defeat that plan. And the Liberals were crushed in this riding because they put that plan here. People understood what the air quality impacts would be. They understood the climate impacts. They fought against it. They fought against it. Right now, Doug Ford's saying, man, we got to expand gas. We're going to have this electricity shortage. And as my colleague said, this is a guy who took a meat axe to energy efficiency programs. He canceled hundreds of renewable energy projects. And he literally demolished a wind farm in eastern Ontario to deliver on his platform. Literally demolished a wind farm. So we could all go on and blank about his stims and bad practice. In fact, my colleagues could go extemporaneously at least half an hour each <laughs> along with me and it would be like the choir. We'd be fabulous. But I want to talk more about what we need to do, how to push back, because it's quite correct. He's got a majority in the legislature. And it's a question I think for us of mobilizing people beyond the legislature and beyond downtown Toronto in order to be successful. He has to be beaten in the court of public opinion. And I think that's a doable thing. Me, because you do love it. I'm not loud enough? No. <laughs> Damn. The slide slide on some louder. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I was holding back. A mistake on my part. I'll, I'll go into my inner politician. Follow it out. Uh, sorry, live stream fiction authors. So the first thing, and, and Mike touched on this, is to talk about the expensive nature of the option that has been chosen by the poor government. And folks, everyone in this room understands the climate issues, I have no doubt, the air quality issues, but an awful lot of the poor base is just focused on dollars, you know, tax cuts, all of that stuff. They need to know that Ford has picked an extraordinarily expensive option to deal with our electricity needs. And I'll give you two groups that make a counter-argument. And one, you won't really be surprised, the Electricity Distributors, Distributors Association here in Ontario, they represent the local utilities like Toronto Hydro. They did a study. And another, an totally unusual and unexpected source, the Royal Bank of Canada did a study. <laughs> Now, let me tell you, World Bank of Canada, not exactly on the green list and good people. Uh, and I'm understating it. They also came out and said, hey, wait a minute, this is a pretty pricey approach that you're taking, Doug Ford. A lot cheaper to go with efficiency and conservation. You know, salt in a little solar. Uh, two organizations with credibility and analytical backup to show that it's cheaper, cheaper, less expensive, fewer dollars to take another option. These are groups that are not referred to as enviral lunatics, as many of us might be. Uh, I was once referred to in the Toronto Sun as an enviral lunatic, so I wear, I wear a problem. The government's own plan, Ford plan, shows the cost of different options. The cost of gas-fired power in their document, and I'm sure, Jack, you could enlarge on this, it may be an understatement, but they say gas is 11.3 cents a kilowatt hour. You know that energy efficiency and conservation is under three cents a kilowatt hour. The math is really clean and simple and clear. Like it is a lot cheaper to go out and make things more efficient. It's not just cheaper overall though. And I, actually, I should have enlarged a bit on that. Royal Bank of Canada, again, believe me, if you're being criticized from the progressive Greek position by the Royal Bank, you are just totally out there, like totally out there. They're saying we could save half a billion dollars a year through energy efficiency and conservation as opposed to putting in gas. Half a billion, that's actual money. You could do something with half a billion. Uh, that's part of the argument that has to be made. And the other part is, if you're actually going out to people's homes and businesses and say, we're gonna put money into your home and business, 
And not only are you going to help the whole of the electricity system, but it's going to reduce your costs this year, next year, and for years to come. That's a very powerful personal art to make with Peter, people and Peter. Um, <laughs> we need to get that information out. And I don't think it's wrong to make the argument about climate impacts and air quality impacts. The climate emergency is real. People taste it and they can breathe it. But there's a big chunk of that forward base that responds more to numbers and to cash than those considerations. We need to go out and talk to a variety of bodies. Now, the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, you guys, I mean, you're kind of small, but you do amazing stuff. Um, they went out and got cities and municipalities across Ontario to come up with declarations saying that they need to move away from gas-fired power in Ontario. We need to go to Nigeria. And they were right, she said. And the Ford government had to have two reports written denouncing them, um, which, I, again, that's a compliment. You, you provoke them. Uh, we need to go further. We need to get those councils to say, we want the option that is reliable, that's sustainable, and damn, the option that's cheaper. That's the one we want. Because if you get municipalities and cities across Ontario doing that, saying we want the good option that costs less, that starts making news. It starts having an impact. I also want to suggest, though, that it would be useful to talk to Kiwanis Clubs, Chambers of Commerce, actually the Tax Cares Federation. Tax Cares Federation has recently, recent years, gone after Ford over some of the offensive. He needs to feel the heat on that side of the ledger. He's lost your vote. If there are any Ford voters in this room, I know you will be discreet. But I... <laughs> man, yeah, really discreet. So I, I'm not going to ask for a show ahead, but, but I think he lost this room a while ago. What you need to do, what we need to do, is we need to get to the room that he still thinks that he has, and that is going to be critical for us. So I think I've made most of my arguments. Make sure you have that, yes, the end of the world, that's a good argument, and it's going to cost you while you're waiting for the end of the world. That's going to meet or make access to the Ford voters a lot better and get it out. This is a big fight. It's not a fight that's going to be over tomorrow, it's not going to be over for years, but it's a fight I believe that we can win. And again, I want to thank you. At back there, environmental defense, you guys. Yeah. And Cynthia's for climate action networks. You guys. They're fighting their new day class. Thank you. Oh, find it back. I didn't see your table back. Find it back, too. Absolutely. Sorry. I have all of you. That was the same as one of your grandmothers. But I'm happy to be here, thrilled to be here. Um, usually, when I'm at an environmental um, event, protest, like in my former life, I would be wearing a costume. Uh, you know, wind turbine, a recycling bin, uh, pee in a pod on my farmer's market, but I'm wearing regular clothes tonight for now. Um, and, uh, but we'll see where we go for, with our green groundswell we're going to create in the future. But thrilled to be here. Thanks to Ontario Clean Air Alliance, Jazzy Jack, Awesome Angela, and all the folks. Uh, Peter Tabins, greener than green. I've known him from my former, former, former life with uh, ETCAG. <laughs> That's a hairball of a name, ETCAG. East Toronto Climate Action Group back in the day. And Mike Schreiner beside me, who uh, actually is really the reason who dragged me back into uh, politics. Um, got me off the couch and very worried about the climate emergency. So he's to blame. <laughs> Anyways, thrilled to be here. And... Um, um, my brothers call me the Eco Witch of the East, uh, which I wear as a, a proud, uh, proud name because there are good witches, of course. And when Peter was talking about uh, being at the protest for the uh, for the Portland's plant in the first place, I uh, dug out my old picture, which you cannot see. There I am with long hair, and my two kids dragged out to the protest, and my placard says "Conservation, anyone." And my kids say, turn off your AC, renewables rock. And they have moved to British Columbia to get the hell away from their mother. 
Uh, <laughs> and, and maybe the okay. premier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well. Um, but yes, I used to be. I really and thank you all for coming because you know I was on the other side. I mean, I still I feel there are no boundaries here. But I used to be out at every protest, as I said, in a costume. And you know, I don't want you to give up hope because there are good people in office. And uh, I'll say there are two, anyways, here tonight. And um, we we continue to fight the good fight. And I I don't want you to give up hope because I know it can be extremely disheartening. Uh, but it's not, because we're going to work together and create that bloody green swell to overtake the government in 2026 with people who actually are not allergic to the words climate action. Um, so we know his destruction record. Uh, we know um, how he's killed all these renewable uh, agreements w uh, when he first took office. We know he's uh, been in court and lost in court over that. Uh, we know we're waiting for this climate change um, uh, impact assessment report. We've been waiting for it with Minister Pacini on that forever. Um, we're, uh, we're, I, we don't know where that is. We're going to hire Sherlock Holmes to help us find it. And, and we're going to keep pushing, pushing to have that come forth because we know what that's going to say. Um, and it's, it's going to be, it's going to be scary when, when that re report comes out, but we will plaster it everywhere all over Ontario and beyond. Um, you know, we, um, we uh, know he's not investing. He's, he's removed the EV subsidy, even though he's a big electric vehicle. <laughs> this is all he's talking about. Like, we're going to save the, the planet with the electric vehicles. Uh, that's basically it. Um, and maybe a new uh, provincial park. And uh, that's, that's essentially the plan. And, but yet, where is the electricity coming from, right? And... We're going back in time. All the rest of the world is going forward with renewables, with conservation, and that people, someone here tonight said, yeah, well, what's the alternative? The alternative is conservation and renewables, and we're not doing anything about those. And, you know, we, it can all be done with education. People will do the right thing if they know to turn down the thermostat, turn down their AC if they can. They, if they know why they need to do that. I was in Berlin, and they have everyone turning down the thermostat in the winter to 18 degrees, and they're doing a whole education like sweaters against Putin. And once you do something like that, like people get it, right? And you make it fun, even though it's disturbing and upsetting, but you, and you get together with everyone, you do that. We can do that. We're not doing anything on that. Where are the subsidies for the deep, green retrofits of our houses. Like, come on. The pocket change pro project in Peter's Ward is fantastic. We're trying to replicate that across the city. Peter's hogging it, and he's very spoiled with them. But we want to do that. People want to do the right thing. And we're here to help you do that. Um, what else do I have to say about that? Um, just... Yeah, well, and the, the Liberals did close the coal plants back in the day, and we were like, what were we, 93% reduction in emissions, and now where are we going? The complete opposite. And the rest of the world, it's actually embarrassing and cringing, cringeworthy where we're going with the Ontario government. I don't know what the hell their problem is. With, like, open your eyes. Maybe most of the Conservatives need to have eye surgery, but the world is on fire. Ontario is on fire right now. It's right in your face. We have extreme heat. We have floods. Don't even get me going on my private member's bill that I tried to get passed. I spoke to 122 of the 124 members. Uh, it was a private member's bill on emergency preparedness, flooding uh, awareness. And, you know, I tried to use language. I didn't use climate change. I used emergency preparedness. They had, most of them were keen on it and committed, and then they killed it. So, you know what? Them fighting words. We're not taking this line down. We will work together with people. The three of us are working together for sure. But I'm telling you, we're not laying down with this. We are going to continue to fight the good fight and save Ontario. Well done. No slapping there. Okay, now it's your turn. Look at you, Keener. Come on up. Hi, Boyd. 
So, so guess what? Three parties, Liberals, Greens, NDP, we already are the majority. We already are. <laughs> so so what's the problem with a 40%, the, the, the Ford got 40% when he got into, 40% of the voters when he got into power. So f figure that one out. Okay, I'll just keep it brief because there's other, other questions and probably some online. I'll keep it very brief. Make seats match votes. Four words, make seats match votes. Four words, go to makeseatsmatchvotes.ca or go to fairvote.ca or another thing, September 25th, there is a charter challenge. We are challenging the constitutionality of our unfair voter system in Canada. We're going to start in Canada and the domino effect is going to hit Ontario. September 25th, we got a court date in Toronto. Charterchallenge.ca. Write it down right now. Charterchallenge.ca. Check it out. It's grassroots supported. It's not, it's a thousand people just like you and me. We, we put it this way. We're, we're not fooling around. Fairvote.ca is Fairvote Canada. Fairvote Canada is, is working on a citizen's assembly. Charter Challenge is working on the, on the, on the fact that it's our vo voter equality is our right Right? We can't have voter equality when you get 40% of the voters getting 60% of the seats. That's not voter equality, right? So check it out. Either go to fairvote.ca, charterchallenge.ca. September 25th, the big date, Charter Challenge. You want to come up? Thanks, Angela. My name's Lynn Adamson, and I'm co-chair of Climate Fast. I'm also co-chair of the city's Climate Advisory Group, City of Toronto. We were appointed 26 citizens to try to uh, work with the staff and council to achieve the net zero by 2040 uh, plan that the city has adopted, adopted in December 2021. And actually this coming budget year, for the very first time, we're gonna have a carbon budget. Um, so carbon is gonna be counted in every, uh, yeah, so. Um, the city, seriously wants to meet these targets, but is not able to do so without a clean grid, okay? So it will be impossible for us to reach net zero by 2040 if the province insists on putting this gas on the grid and we don't use renewables and conservation. So my question is to do with the climate target of the province and the role of the Auditor General, which I heard she's doing an investigation into green belt acquisitions, but what is being done about the fact that they're going the opposite direction of our, even their very modest climate target that was scaled back from what the Liberals was. So if you could answer that, because can't we legally go after them on this? Like really, we should be able to, because this is criminal. What they're doing, everybody, it's criminal. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's register that, thank you. My guess is both my colleagues will want to speak to this as well. The Auditor General has already come out and said, you know, the plan is junk, and they're not even meeting that. I mean, she has been very clear for a few years now. She did an initial report, and then she did a follow-up report. I mean, some of her recommendations was, uh, make your, your recommendations based on evidence. Now, <laughs> when the Auditor General says, you should use evidence when you're doing stuff, that's an indication that, again, you're pretty far out there. Uh, so the Auditor General has investigated. She's condemned them roundly, which is part of the reason that when she wanted to get an extension in her contract to the end of this year, there was no way on earth. No way on earth. Anyway, my colleagues may well enhance what I've had to say. You know, I'll just say that they fired the Environment Commissioner, uh, thinking that the Auditor General was going to be the, their friend, but their plan is so awful that even the Auditor General, who I would say nobody would say this Auditor General is a raving environmentalist, uh, essentially said their plan is is um, scientifically invalid and doomed to fail. So uh, we, so so this is where a point Mary Margaret made about the climate impact assessment is an interesting one because, as Peter knows, 
we've been asking the environment, well, this is our third environment minister. We've been asking this question and they keep answering with the climate impact assessment. Like that's about every answer, isn't it, Peter? And they still haven't delivered it yet. And so, and I think the reason they haven't delivered it is exactly what Mary Margaret said is they know their plan will fail. And so this is where the point Peter made earlier, we have to win in the court of public opinion. And I do think the best way to win in the court of public opinion, especially in rural and conservative writings, is on the issue of cost. Yep, money talks. And I mean, they fired the Ontario Environment Commissioner, but the good news is she's now city councillor. So touche on that. And we'll see um, what goes on there. Um, I will say, I will echo what my... Um, my green guys next to me are saying. But I also want to mention that on Monday, um, there was a Ontario government released the report entitled Powering Ontario's Growth. And you know what? You're going to just love it. There are no specific targets, no cost estimates, and no concrete commitment to net zero by 2050. So more bullshit, pardon my French. And... Um, we're not going to take it lying down. We're, we're going to add all this, but we need to get these facts out in a very succinct manner for all of us to spread the word to our neighbors, our family, um, and enemies, whomever, so we can create that green groundswell. Because we need people to wake up and vote <laughs> to protect each other in 2026. So we are all going to have to do that together. Thanks. I've got, to, I, I've got to throw this in. Um, there's a committee where you actually get to question the minister uh, about their budget. And, and Mike and I were tag teaming. Uh, and I asked, can we see the report on in, you know, environmental or sorry, climate impacts in Ontario? Uh, because it's written, right? And this is the, the big thing. It was due in the spring. And I asked, so can we see it? No, not now. And I said, well, what about later this year? No, I don't think later this year. I said, next year, no, can't commit. How about before the election? <laughs> Would not commit. So I don't know who's reading it, someone who's really slow or someone who really doesn't like what it has in it. Uh, hi, I'm DM LaFortune, also known as Mama D. Hi. Uh, I, I want to put something out there, just in your ears. Has anybody seen the story of stuff? It's a film. Okay, everybody here, watch the story of stuff and make it around, because what we're not addressing, the Green Party does, the MVP sort of maybe does sometimes, and the Liberal Party doesn't at all, is the idea of this growth paradigm. I'm sorry. We live on a finite climate, and we have a GNP which, which demands infinite growth. And in this indigenous woman, <clears throat> I saw this growth. I've seen this growth in a big way. The reality is, is there's, okay, you're driving along the highway, you go into a gas station. Is it one of those on route? Yeah, the question is, can you, can, you see all this stuff, and everything is so connected. We have four generations of latchkey kids, and they're consuming junk, junk, junk. They, they have nothing. When can we start using some of the sexy terminology that indigenous people have been using around um, getting that the growth paradigm is something we have to challenge? It really is. It really is. This is consumer capitalism. You did a good job. So good, nobody can even respond. No, she Brian. Made the argument. Yeah, you made the argument. You're right. Sure. Thanks, thanks uh, everybody for. Uh, coming to speak to you on this topic, and thank you everybody for coming out. My name is Brian Champ. I'm uh, the convener of the Climate Voice Network, which is a network of labor groups, uh, environmental groups, uh, social justice groups working to mobilize people around issues of climate justice. And I think um, one of the 
I mean, it's terrible, the plan to expand the gas plants, but it's, it's also an opportunity because one of the issues in the climate movement that's been so challenging is there's, that often it seems like a, like a very either all-encompassing uh, problem that's hard to pin down or it's something that's happening somewhere else or in, in some other way. And I think what makes this struggle really uh, a potential to actually mobilize large numbers of people is the fact that it's happening in the local neighborhood here. Um, it's affecting the health of people in the local neighborhood. And, um, and it's uh, also contributing to climate change at the same time. And um, we see with the wildfires, which are approaching the size of the country of South Korea. This is the size of the wildfires in Canada which is already broken records in terms of the area consumed. And at, that's been made concrete by the smoke that's come into the cities and so on. And, and I do agree with the last speaker. We have to challenge this, uh, this economy, which is based on, and it's really driven by the, the elite that want to endlessly grow their profits and their accumulate their uh, power in that way. And, but I think we have people power and, and, I, and I think the people in this community, we need to go out into the community. We need to build as broadly as we can. Like, like Peter said, go to Kiwanis, go to the, you know, go to the Legion, go to the beach, go, go everywhere throughout the community. And, um, you know, and I think the other issue that we have to address here that I don't think has been addressed is the fact that we have to also challenge uh, Doug Ford on jobs. You know, and I think this is one of the issues of the just transition, part of one of the climate justice demands um, is related to jobs. And so the workers that are working in that plant, they're not the enemy. We need to find jobs for everybody who's working in these dirty industries and find a way to transition toward that future that where we, we all have a chance of, of living together. So anyway, I, I'm eager to work with everybody in this room, let's get out in the community and build this thing. I, I want to I wanna just answer Mama D's question a little bit because I've been thinking a lot about this. Like, We know what the policies are. We know what the prescriptions are. But yet, we don't seem to have the political will, not only as a government, but as a society to do it. And I think a lot of it is rooted in a lack of empathy and a lack of caring. And I think we need a caring economy. So when you force people to live in legislated poverty through our horrendously low social assistance rates, it's hard to talk about climate action. When you are about privatizing health care instead of providing care for people, it's hard to talk about climate action. And so until we care about each other, it's hard to care about the planet. And so some of it, I think, is, is a, a realignment of our values and our values of the kind of society and kind of people we want to be. And to me, it's rooted in empathy and caring. And we have an empathy deficit, and we need to build a caring economy. I, I, first of all, I'd like to say I think you're right. I mean, I, I think you've nailed it. That is a substantial problem that we have to address. But I, I want to speak to the other side of it because there's no doubt there are huge job creation opportunities out there. Just when you rebuild a society and you launch a whole new generation of technology, you have job opportunities for people that can make a huge difference in their lives. And we should not ever underestimate, because sometimes it's set to the side, there are powerful forces constantly trying to crush this. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think, Mike, Mary Margaret, you were there when I brought forward my anti-fracking bill. But I was quite uh, impressed in a negative way by the way the gas companies came around beating up on MPPs to vote against uh, this bill to stop fracking. Like, they are energetic. They are well-informed. They're well-connected. They're well-resourced. And they are constantly putting junk out in the media about this. Uh, we, we should never forget that we're dealing with a well-resourced, 
intelligent, and I use the word in narrow sense, uh, opposition who are protecting billions and trillions of dollars in assets and profits, and they will go to great lengths to make sure the kind of stuff that you talked about doesn't happen. Oh, sorry, Mary. Oh, that's okay. Um, thank you very much. Agree with uh, my partners in crime up here for sure. And but I just want to address Brian's uh, comment, and it's so true. You know, there is a huge role for for the government in transitioning um, workers over to green jobs. And we, well, the government is doing a huge disservice in in not uh, reskilling people the way they should to keep. Uh, to keep pace with the rest of the world. Companies will not invest in Ontario. If they don't have the green uh, measures in place. We don't have the skill set. How, you know, um, we, as Brian said, we shouldn't be mad at the workers for having these jobs in these places, but let's help reskill them and help transition them. So let's help the ga train the gas fitters to install heat pumps. Let's, like, skill up people to be energy auditors. We hear about, you know, that people want to do the right thing and retrofit their home, but they're waiting forever from trying to find, looking up in the yellow pages or wherever you look for an energy auditor and they're not there. And, you know, we want to, um, Mass Timber is, is you know, on on the move and we want to reskill people in, in that as well instead of concrete. And so how, how are we doing that? We're doing nothing on that. And, Doug Ford's all about the trades, the trades, which is great. We need people in the trades to, to build our 1.5 million homes, but we want to build homes in the right places uh, with the right materials and make them energy efficient. How do we do that if we don't have the skilled labors? Okay, so just to fill you in, we have... Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six questions here. And then I have four from online. So thank you for all those questions. Let's like really boot through them, try to be straight to the, just get right to the point. And same with the answers. Let's see how, let's, we got a half an hour. Let's get through them all. Thank you, Angela. Going to get right to the point. My name is Alan Silverman. I work with one of the groups at the back, Seniors for Climate Action Now. And all our, all the people up front have talked about people power. And I think that is the key. If we look at what happened with the education workers when Ford tried to take away their rights, they went to the streets and he backed down, so we have to do the same. So I am encouraging you right now, when this is over, to go to the back, take some literature, give it to some friends, get them involved, put your name down on a list, because there is a coalition of all the activist groups working together so that we can build the same force that got Ford to back down and he will hopefully back down on this too. Thank you very much. Sorry, I just note that we are one year into a four-year mandate. He is not going to change. We have eight years until the UN says we have to reduce our emissions by 50%. So that is the first four years are Doug Ford's. And I look around and I say, I don't think what we're proposing is going to get there. Because what we're doing is, all the people in this room, has, has, has been noted, are on board. But what we're talking about is kind of like random acts of energy efficiency and random acts of defiance, which looks a lot like nimbyism. And when you get all the people who are not in this room, what they're afraid of is the unknown. Like, what will happen if we make this change, will my life change? Will my children starve? Will all of these things, right? Okay, we know something is bad out there, but what I would like to challenge everyone at this table to do, and full disclosure, I am a member of the Green Party, but what I would like to challenge you is to spend a year 
going to nonpartisan, well, no one's nonpartisan, but a group of people who are experts in the technology to put together a costed plan that we can then sell in the last two years of the Ford mandate that says, this is how we are going to get to a 50% reduction in eight years. And this is how we're going to get to 100% reduction in the next eight years. Because all the people, you are already convinced. So, and we're not enough, or we're not in the right places. Thank you, uh, first past the post. But so what we need to do is we need to put together a plan that shows the conservatives, not the, the big C conservatives, the guys who are voting for them, that shows them that a green future is a prosperous and successful future. And no, you will not freeze in the dark. That's what we need to do. Uh, first of all, um, the three of us have had a good chance of speaking, and we'll try and restrain ourselves because we need more comments from you. Um, Sheena, and my guess is, Mike, you've done this, and my guess, Mary Morgan, you've done it. The NDP put out its Green New Democratic deal in the last election, and actually, given the limitations of election documents, it actually did cost what we were going to do. Uh, we did have a budget. We did have a plan for substantial reduction in emissions. Um, could it be better? A, a deeper, better research, yes. But I think all three parties at this table probably came out. Uh, Mike, I'm sure I read yours as well, uh, taking notes. I, may I say I don't think our problem is a lack of a plan? I, I, no, I, I understand. <laughs> Which is a fair perspective, Sheena. I'm not going to... but. But, but I think our, our problem is we need political power and we need to move people. And very. Okay. Yeah, this one's still working. Um, okay. Um, one thing, whenever you're talking about Doug Ford or anything, never say, oh, he'll never do that. Because that gives him, you know, he gets back to them and then he can say, you know what, they don't expect us to do anything. So, you know, we're not going to bother doing anything. All right. Now, the question I got is why are solar panels not being used in buildings and on vehicles and ships and trains? You know, once they can use the diesel to get going if they need the power, but once it's moving, they can use solar power to keep the thing running. You can, you know, you got you got tankers going across the ocean. You got you got long trains going across the prairies. You know, you you we got ferries going across the island here that are diesel. You know, why, why can't we have uh, ferries that have solar panels on the roof? You know, we they, they should be on the sides of buildings, on the sides of all these office buildings. You know, where they got glass panels, those should all be solar panels. That should be part of the building code. Why can't we do that? Get uh, start acting, start start advocating that the building codes and uh, the, the the transportation code be changed to include solar panels on the stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Ingrid Sheriff. I'm a lifelong resident. Well, he said, you know, he went to Bower Road Public School, a cop school in Gerard. And also went to Danforth Beach and Technical Institute back in the early 90s, 2000s. So I care very much about this and I keep in touch with a lot of people that I used to go to school with and that I went to school with. And welcome to my public school, Nathaniel Larson Smith, who's not here, who's a the Royal MP for Beaches of York, and I've written to Nathaniel as well as Mary Morgan. He got back to me. Um, I'm not convinced that Nathaniel is on board with all this. He's kind of wishy-washy about the nuclear issue. Anyway, besides that, the voter turnout last year in the provincial election was so low, it actually broke my heart. It's like, the amount of things that depend on a vote, and people can't even vote. That's something that's really wrong with that, when people are dying for democracy all over the world, for freedom. Let's just vote here. What's wrong with that? I think y'all most of you vote, I'm pretty sure. But can we, pay, can we remind people that it's cool to vote? That it's standing on guard for the heat of vote? It's being Canadian? It's being a world citizen? And it's a selfish thing to do, is vote. Because you're saying, this is what I want. So, Bowmore Road Public School and Danforth Tech 
It also knows Danforth Beach and Tickle and Sue's having their 100th anniversary uh, this year. And I know there was a fire at Omer recently, so it's being rescheduled for the fall. But uh, Danforth Tech is having their 100th anniversary at the end of October this year. So I'll just be talking to all my friends and everybody who's still, like, you know, wants to talk. You know, there'll be lots of dis discussion. And, you know, when you're at barbecues or just at the cottage or you're just, you know, enjoying all the summer festivals and everything and just meeting up with people as you have time off, or maybe you don't, just just talk to people and you don't have to get the advice. Just say, go vote, man. Stand on guard for thee. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> But we cannot wait till 2026. There's a by election July 27th. Please talk about that. That's yeah. in Scarborough Guildwood. Sure. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. There's a by election in Scarborough Guildwood right now. Yeah. 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 Everybody, Everybody, needs everybody to vote. should get one of those things in their box. Yeah. All the voters. Free. So do we have volunteers to do that? That's what my question. That is the direction. <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about what literature and what's available at the back of the room at the end, for sure. But we d definitely need to reach all the candidates at Scarborough and Gilwood during that, this upcoming by-election. Okay, we and have the two other here. -elections. And the other by-elections. Yeah. yeah, there's three. Thank you. And they're in two Did weeks. You, two weeks, months, sure. guys. You know? They're in two weeks. Yeah. You know what? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm a teacher. And I work with, uh, I work with young people. I'm a high school teacher. Name? And my question. Name, yeah. What's your uh, name? Cam. Cam. Uh, with the Toronto, Toronto Cam. District School Cam. Board. So, Cam, Cam Kilgore. And I work with Councillor Sachs uh, uh, as a volunteer. Uh, University Rosedale Ward 11. Uh, so, I've noticed a mental health epidemic parallel to the pandemic. So, youth are suffering extraordinary levels of anxiety and depression. Uh, suicidal ideation. So my question to you, Mary Margaret, Mike, and Peter, is uh, how can we engage young people in the political process? Uh, that's it. Thank you very much, um, Cam, for bringing that important issue up. Um, because, you know, when I speak to youth, I... I Ingrid, you'll, you'll be proud. I really try and empower them to vote. Um, and, um, you know, they're so disheartened. Um, I try and tell them, you hold the balance of power. You can do it. Come on. But again, that's more pressure on them. Um, and they don't, a lot of them don't believe it. I have uh, tw my, <laughs> my little guys here are 24 and 25 out in British Columbia. You know, they're, my daughter especially is, you know, she's deciding may, not to have children to bring them into this messed up world. I don't think she's alone in that. It is so disheartening. They are disheartened. They don't believe in their politicians. They don't believe, you know, boomer generation who robbed them of everything in their minds and, and not totally wrong. And so, yes, we have to give them hope. And that's an, one of the reasons I got back in with climate emergency is to get off my duff and actually show them that real people, you have three up here right now, well, you have Angela too, but th real people can go into politics. <laughs> but we, but I, what I'd say about my, my partners in crime right here, like real people who tell you what it is, who don't play games, who want to fight for a better world with all of you for the greater good. And they, we just need to model the behavior. I'll try to be really quick. Yeah, great answer. I think one thing is empower youth to make decisions. And even if they make decisions you don't necessarily agree with. I remember when the young Greens wanted to do a campaign, we need 80% less bullshit in politics. And a few people were like, really? And it was like, yeah, let them do it. It's one of the best campaigns they ever ran. So I would say empower young people. Let them be in charge. Like, let them run with it. And in some cases, I think financially support as well. There's a lot of youth engagement and activism that's grossly financially under-resourced. And so I think if, you know, some organizations like political parties and uh, environmental organizations, I know we're all strapped for cash, but supporting and funding youth. And I want to go to the mental health really quick. Um, 
we talk about what will motivate people who may not be as motivated as environmentalists to actually take climate seriously, and health is one of the biggest ones. And so if we can work with organizations like CAPE, Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, and other groups, like I've been really in encouraging uh, health groups to, or health professionals to get involved. And the other one is faith groups, actually. And uh, so, uh, uh, and getting faith groups uh, more involved. So looking at how... Exactly. Yeah. Actions like that. Absolutely. And so looking for allies in places that we don't necessarily would think to find them, and health is one of the biggest ones. Yeah, Cam, it's a very substantial question. Uh, I've been trying to make myself available to talk to, to youth. Uh, I've told high school teachers in this, right? Actually, I've told elementary teachers as well. I'm happy to come and speak to classes. Um, some teachers have told me that it's difficult to get me into a school because it's seen as a partisan move to have me show up. Uh, but, but I think... You've got to move to Guelph. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're already <laughs> occupying the seat, Mike. Jesus, man. <laughs> uh, in, in any event, I, I think we as politicians should make ourselves available to young people, particularly where teachers or schools are willing to have us come in. That's great. Um, interestingly, in this riding, uh, the students at Riverdale Collegiate carried on a campaign against the attack on the Greenbelt. Uh, they collected their own petition. I had a, a web-based town hall one of their representatives was there, and just making that political space available for them. They came to Queen's Park to have their petition presented. I had them in the gallery. I mean, that, these are all little things, but just saying what you're doing is valid. We recognize it as a substantial contribution. It's not just little kids have fun. No, you're doing serious things in this society, and we have respect for you. I think that makes a difference. Uh, my name is Don Booth. I'm one of the usual suspects. Um, I just first of all, I, I want to say that I really appreciated uh, the comments. I really appreciated the comments you made about um, where where we can where Doug Ford is vulnerable. That is uh, rural areas, not the this riding, not these ridings. Um, I'm personally going to volunteer in Scarborough Guildwood because um, it's right next door. Um, but uh, I really like the comments about um, uh, Chamber of Commerce and Taxpayers Federations. They're provincial, and we can all write them a note and say, hey, we support you. These guys are trying to fleece us. How can we make a meaningful difference outside of the 416? What can we do those of us who unite the country and everyone blaming Toronto for everything. What, but it's a very serious question. What can we do to lend a hand outside of progress, progressive bas, bastions like our own? Well, I have a really quick one because kids usually get it. Um, and, you know, TDSB does a great job with eco schools, which is... Uh, uh, Jack's uh, partner used to help run that. It's phenomenal. So kids get it. Get the kids to talk to their grandparents up north, wherever they are, and uh, let them hear it from them about how they're destroying their world. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. Lots of anger in rural Ontario right now about farmland loss. Uh, and I go to rallies in a lot of rural areas, conservative and suburban areas too, uh, a lot of the people showing up at those rallies have told me, like, I have voted conservative my entire life, and I'm not voting conservative this time because they're literally destroying what I love about my farm, you know, Niagara Escarpment, whatever. And so uh, allying with those kinds of groups around those kinds of issues. I mean, Ford just backed down on the severancing issue because all the farm organizations united and said, no way, you're going to do this. And so creating those alliances are really important. We all eat, so I think we can connect with rural farmers as urban eaters and build alliances. Yeah, I, I think what Mike has said is very important. Uh, I'll add, if you have friends and relatives and the rest of Ontario, talk to them. Get them to be active. And 
Jack and Angela somehow have figured out how to get to councils across this province. I would say talk to them and support the work that they do because they're effectively reaching out, very effectively. DM said more heart, more art and music. Okay, we got some questions from, from the live stream. And just to say, I, I hope that the live streamer people found their new link. Some people did, great. Okay, so we do have some really good quick questions. One, how do we get Olivia Chow to be our ally in, in opposing the gas plant expansion? Toronto City Council already opposes the gas plant expansion. They passed a resolution. She supports that resolution. Good answer. Thank you. She's on side. She even has a heat pump and solar panels and rides a bike. Okay. If the gas plant is a gas peaker plant, what do we replace it with if we start phasing it out? Well, first of all, I should say that, to my knowledge, this isn't the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the GTA because they turn it on every now and then. They're, they're using it very heavily. Uh, so it's not just a peaker plant. And frankly, that is why the investment in efficiency and conservation is so critical. When you reduce the need for energy, you do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It is the cheapest alternative and reduces or eliminates the need for peaker plants. And both Royal Bank of Canada and the Electricity Distributors Association make exactly those points, exactly those points. So yes, as long as you've got a big peak, you've got a problem. If you cut demand with efficiency and conservation, you eliminate the need for peaker plants. Oh, sorry. Can I just add, yeah. when we have the ministers come to committee, I asked the energy minister on this. They are using gas plants now as baseload power. Yeah. So they are, they are not just using them for peaking. And so it's my, it's, your, your answers on peak are absolutely right, but they are using gas as baseload now. Yeah. Who exactly are the corporations that are benefiting from this gas plant expansion and other gas plant expansions? Well, well, I would say, first off, Enbridge. Um, and so Enbridge, the distributor within Ontario, and Enbridge, the larger pipeline operator across North America, and then the gas developers and producers who feed into those pipelines. Those corporations are good friends. They support each other. They are making billions. And so if you are a company that supplies natural gas, you want more of it burned every day. Uh, there are others who are interested. There are construction companies, um, and I'm not going to go through a list of construction companies, but the heart of it is fossil fuel interests, and Enbridge is the only name that you need to know. Are there any, are there any legal steps that can be taken to stop this? Any lawyers in the house? Lawyers in the I am. Or, yeah, no, I, mean, yeah. I just want to say something. You talked about a call over Sharon, who was um, medical, the medical society of this country. There's actually a group of doctors out of British Columbia who are trying to fight. Um, you know, all, all the entities that are creating so much pollution. I think we have to use them as allies, work with them, because, you know... They're on board. They all of, all of this pollution is affecting little children. Their, their lungs are so small, and they're developing still, and this is going to have lifelong effects on them. And it's also affecting older people. And... You know, being that it's the older generation through short-sightedness that has created this whole mess and also the fact that this world can't uh, contain as many people as we have. You know, we, we have to start thinking about the health of the planet and the health of children. Because how are, how are you going to have a good society if people are sick? if they're not well. This is where you have to go. And with Doug Ford, 
It's like Doug Ford is here, pushing this way, pushing that way, pushing this way, with all of the things that we're talking about, and he'll topple over. But it has to be done with a lot of energy, and we can't think about the next election. That's too late. Yeah. That's right. It's too late. It's too late. You have a teacher here who's talking about the effects. I owe a question. Uh, I'm sorry, but I don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, um, U of T was doing a research study where they were doing air quality monitoring in different yes. neighborhoods. Yeah. And I would suggest that, maybe I'll connect Peter yeah. to this as yeah. the MPD, to do something like that in this neighborhood, specifically for the Portland plant. Yeah, good idea. Um, but I'm also a constitutional appellate lawyer. Um, sort of retired. I think we do. I think we could cease an injunction. And I think it's time we revisit peace order and good government. That clause. I think we go in that broad stroke that way. It hasn't been visited I sent since I think uh, the aid cases back then. Is it good government supply to man? I think it's been that long. But I think the POG clause is something to get in on. Because this is not good government. We have the numbers to show it isn't. And the reality is, if we get the legal team in place to do this, and we seek this, we can get a stay of them doing anything until they're out of power. That's what they do to us. They deep pocket us into oblivion and then push things through. We can do the same thing. My name is Mei Wong, and I spent the last couple of months um, canvassing during the mayoral election. And talking to the streets in the suburbs of Toronto, you get a lot of conversations like, I can't make rent, why do I care about the environment? I can't afford food, how do I start talking about you know, opposing the gas plant? I mean, we are all here because we, because we can afford to be here. We have the privilege to be here. Um, so how do we talk to the people who don't have the privilege to be here and tell them this is still really important because like it goes back to your point about like we're all struggling because of the system we live in. So well, how do we talk about this? May I think what you raised is really critical and that's part of the reason I spoke at the beginning about the need to talk to people about the cost that this right, this decision that's anti-environmental is also really expensive. It will hit them in the pocketbook and where it doesn't, where subsidies are used by the Tories to cover over the problem, it sucks money out of social services, it sucks it out of healthcare, all of that. And they need, people need to know that this is not just distant, it affects them in their pocketbook. And I think the other argument about health is a really good one. If you're having trouble getting food regularly, um, if your lungs are deteriorating because of air pollution, you are being hit doubly. And I, I think talking about health and cost are things that would make sense to people who are being squeezed in those areas. sounds like you're doing this already, is also advocate for issues that are going to improve people's lives. We need to more than double social assistance rates. We need to build more affordable housing. We need to ensure health care. So, I mean, so making sure you're creating those alliances. And then another one for me is give the media a rough time. I am so sick and tired right now of like, you know, this flood happened because of climate change. This drought is affecting food prices because of climate change. Like I'm, I finally, and, and actually giving a rough time works. Um, on food, I've been doing it hard because most of the experts are the University of Guelph. And I finally went to three of them and I said, Guys, you're all talking about climate, but you're not using the word. And I've noticed now that when they're doing CBC interviews and media interviews, they're actually using the word climate and connecting it. So don't be afraid to push the so-called experts out there. Yeah, and I just agree with everyone here with all this, but I, with you, um, May Wong, I was a big surprise to me when I was door knocking uh, for the election a, a year ago. 
um, thinking that climate emergency would be right rolling off everyone's tongues. And it was not like as much, it was a bit, but it was the affordability crisis, big eye opener to me. And you know, you learn your the most when you door knock. And so I'm, I'm really proud of you to, for bringing that to light. And really it's, it's what my partner said, but that it's, it's cheaper to go green in the long run. Hello, my name is Ralph Torrey. Um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to comment that there's hope in history on this issue. We don't always see hope when we look at history, but in 1974, I was 22. Might have a few contemporaries in the room. Ontario Hydro tabled a plan that had 28 nuclear reactors post Darlington and 18 big coal-fired plants, uh, all were going to have to be online by 2005, or the lights will go out. The conservative government of the day called a royal commission. They were so freaked out, not by the nuclear part, but by the capital cost. Not one of those plants, to this day, was ever built. 1989, now I'm 27, I'm married, I've got two toddlers. Ontario Hydro tabled another plan called the Demand Supply Plan. More nukes, more coal plants because electricity was going to start growing again. They called an environmental assessment, it got underway. and Before it was finished, they took the plan off the table. Not one of those plants was ever built. Uh, 2004, after going 15 years without any long-term planning, because who needs to plan long-term when you're swimming in a surplus of power uh, so much that it bankrupt the utility? They thought, they went into a panic, they expedited the approval of those gas plants, thinking that gap was going to develop between supply and demand. They kinda sort of built some of those plants, they weren't needed. So the logic of this system is so screwed up that, and the logic of what we're proposing is so aligned with where we need to go and what would actually work and what would be good for communities, including poor people in cities, that this is winnable. And, and uh, I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you for indulging me. I think we can win this one. We have a lot more going for us now than we did in 1975. I, I think there were 12 of us at that hearing. <laughs> and... and uh, uh, We've got better technology, better ideas, and we've got great politicians, so we should be able to do this. Right okay, this is a question from Rebel Angel online. What are some things a normal citizen like me can do to help with all this and the climate catastrophe besides voting for better government officials? Can you give me some specific examples? I know Lana from ED is going to give some specific things. Maybe, Lana, you can come up and maybe I'll tell you what we're going to do as well up here. So I, you all got one of these leaflets on your chair. And this, when, like this gives you the big picture about what's happening at the Portland's plant. And if you actually send a letter to your MP at the back saying we want the feds to step in and prevent Doug Ford from, from ramping up gas, because the feds are producing clean electricity regulations right now, they could easily put it in there, they could legislate uh, Ontario or prevent Ontario from ramping up gas. So th this is our, the campaign of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. Um, and if you wanted to help us distribute these, we distributed about 40,000 in the Toronto Star and another 40,000 going out this weekend or on Friday through the Globe and Mail. And we invite people to pop them in mailboxes. You put them in the mailbox like this, the lid goes on top, they're hanging outside. And it's just informs them what the issue is. If they actually do send the letter and then we add them to our database and they keep informed on the issue, it's a way of getting the word out. This, this is our way of informing people. And I brought ab about 6,000 of these leaflets here tonight. I hope I don't have to take them back because I'm on my bicycle. 
But they come in groups of 100. Take as many as you can. And if you do want to distribute like a whole box or several hundred along your street or in Scarborough Gildred, um, maybe just leave me your, your email address and I'll, I'll shoot you an email and find out what streets you're doing so that I make sure someone else doesn't do the same streets. If you're only taking a few hundred, don't worry about it. Chances are good that someone else won't be on your same street. So that's, that's our campaign. I'd like to invite Lana up. Oh, yeah. Also, um, follow us on social media and tell your friends to follow us on social media because every single day I am constantly posting all the links that will help you um, find exactly where you can sign your name, send a letter, um, Doing that actually helps. So yeah, follow us on social media and tell your friends. Thank you. Thanks, Angela, for bringing me up. I'm Lana Goldberg. I'm the Ontario Climate Program Manager at Environmental Defense. And we wholeheartedly support the campaign on the federal clean electricity regulations. We are lobbying uh, the government ourselves. Um, in addition to that, we're running a uh, sorry, a municipal campaign on gas plants because as we heard earlier, uh, new gas projects require municipal resolutions in support. So we have a real opportunity to stop these gas plants at the municipal level. So far, we're doing okay in Toronto, but you know, we could see another gas plant proposal. And of course, there's gas plants all across southern Ontario that could get expanded, i.e., entirely new gas plants built right beside them with new gas turbines. Um, so we have a website with information about Ontario's gas expansion plan, as well as uh, specifics on the Toronto gas plants. And I have a flyer here if you want to grab one. Um, also, we have, oh, so we have these flyers. Um, here's a map of all of the spots that could see new gas plants across southern Ontario. Uh, and we also have these fun lawn signs um, at the back. So please grab one on your way out. And if you'd like to, I, you know, the question was, what can people do? We have a newsletter where we send action alerts when there are opportunities to do something. So, for example, when we saw these uh, count, um, motions coming to council, we sent a note to all of our supporters to say, you know, you can send an email to council members. Um, you know, when there was a rally that Ontario Clean Air Alliance organized, uh, we sent out a note. So, you know, it's a good way to kind of stay connected, uh, hear what's going on, hear about these opportunities to take action. And then we also have uh, lots of resources. And if anyone wants to really get involved in organizing, come talk to me because we also have a bit of a coalition on, on the municipal campaign. So thanks to Ontario Clean Air Alliance for organizing this event and these fantastic speakers. We're very lucky to have them all together in a room. And I'll pass it back to Angela. Hi. Um, so, uh, as I said earlier, I'm co-chair of Climate Fast and also Climate Advisory Group, but I'm also co-chair of the Ontario Clean, uh, sorry, Ontario Climate Emergency Campaign. And I don't have flyers for it tonight, but if you go to ontarioclimateemergency.ca, you will uh, be able to sign up and get our fantastic newsletter. A great many organizations, like 750 organizations across the province and um, hundreds of thousands of, of folks who belong to those organizations are members uh, or at least reachable through this network. We're trying to build that political power by bringing all these groups together. OCAA is a member group. Environmental Defense is a member group. We uh, meet every two weeks, kind of a core group, to do the planning for it. So I'm just going to say that one thing we're doing in September is September 26th, Tuesday, we're going to have a lobby day at Queen's Park. So that's when they're coming back. Uh, thank you, Lynn. I just wanted to say, if you're coming to lobby at Queen's Park on the 26th and you want to see your MPP, tell your MPP in advance that you're coming uh, because we're just pulled in all kinds of directions. But if actual voters contact us and say, we want to see you, it actually has some amazing impact. Thank you. I am really happy to 
have you here and give us some of the facts. Given that the finances are what they are, has anybody talked to the Financial Accountability Office? So on gas plants, no, but I did ask the Financial Accountability Officer to do a study of the financial impacts of the climate crisis. And it is the most comprehensive and best study any jurisdiction's done in the world of the risks to their public infrastructure. And in Ontario, it's $26.2 billion just in the next seven years. That doesn't count the hundreds of billions going up into the future. So there is some good work. On the gas plants, this might be a good one for us to maybe we'll yeah. talk about doing a joint letter or request or something maybe. Um, or you maybe are. Okay, so I see people are ready. Do, do you want to make one last comment, Corey? And then we'll just have final comments from the speakers. And if you're leaving, be sure to grab a stack. Please take 100 of those blue leaflets at the back of the room. Give them to your neighbors, your local cafes. Pop them in mailboxes. Thanks. Um, two quick questions. One on the climate impact study. Could we put a freedom of information request, blitz them with that uh, for the climate impact study, a freedom of information request to get them to, to go there? And then the other question is, so the expansion here in the east seems, seems like a done deal. I don't mean to be a, a Debbie Downer, but... I think we need to talk about direct action. I think we need to, to be talking about protests um, at the plant. Um, you know, we need to get out there. Because I think, you know, Toronto tried to stand up. Toronto said no, but Doug Ford's still going ahead. So we can talk to a blue in the face, write, write letters to Doug Ford to a blue in the face, but I think we have to take some direct action, try and get the federal government to step in. But really, I think we need to be down, protests, signs, that's where I'm at. Corey, you need to connect with Brian. Brian, Corey, and me. Yeah. Brian, are you collecting a list of people? Are you collecting? Did you, you and Corey need to get together, and you should be collecting a list of people. I have the names of everyone here. I will, in a follow-up uh, email, I'll include some contacts. I'll be in touch with Brian and Corey and Lynn, and we'll coordinate some thoughts. Okay, there's a concrete action we'll follow up with. Any final comments from the speakers? No, they're fabulous. You're all great. Yeah, you're amazing. <laughs>